Hey, praise the Lord, it is I, Brother Clinton, once again, and you're back on the Word Prophet channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth, as our Lord Jesus Christ commanded. It is written in John 4.24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So that's why I'm here, and I hope that's why you're here as well. Praise the Lord. If you have your Holy Bible, King James Version, like I do, and you should, please open up with me to Matthew chapter 12. And while you're doing that, I'd like to share with you a portion of a letter that was written to me a couple of weeks ago by a very dear brother in Australia. You know who you are, brother. God bless you. Big hug from Costa Rica. Praise the Lord. This brother's been with me for many years, and he wrote to me some things as far as a suggestion for a video, and he suggested that I might make a video message geared towards the younger of the saints concerning many of the ways that Satan, our adversary, commonly attacks, especially those who are young in the faith. And I thought that was a very good idea, and I told them that I had noted it on my desk, which I have um, right here, and um, which is among the many notes that are on my desk. And I told them that I would be prayerful about it, and I have been, and so here I am, after having prayed about it, turning on the camera, and speaking to you about these things. Praise the Lord. So I have his letter open in front of me, and he made some very good points, and I want to go over those points and kind of expound upon them for you. So, his first point is, uh, this: he has several points here that he has given me concerning how Satan attacks the younger brethren. His first point is this, convince them that they are irredeemable, and they should just give up. The unpardonable sin, or they are a Nephilim, or they sold their soul, etc., etc., and he, he wrote in parentheses, I remember when I was very young, I thought I might be evil because I was the 666th subscriber on your old Word Prophet channel. And that my first and middle and last name are all six letters. So these are ways that the devil attacks, especially those that are young in the faith. And for those of you who don't know, I started this ministry online in 2008. And that's what he meant by the old Word Prophet channel, because I actually had to delete that channel in 2012 because of some problems I was having with an evil worker hacking into the channel. And so that's what he meant by the old Word Prophet channel. But, <clears throat> pardon me, this is why I asked you to open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 12. If you have your Bible open to Matthew chapter 12, let's start in Matthew 12, 22. The scripture says, and may God bless the reading of his word. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, and so much that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed, and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. That was something that they shouldn't have said, but they did. And if we skip over to verse 31, Jesus said, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. And so, those who are young in the faith, one of the most common tricks of the devil is to come to them, or many times even before they even come into the faith of Jesus Christ, the devil will come to them and he will cause them to have a thought, or sometimes even cause them to say something unadvisable. And then after they say that thing, or after they have that thought, the devil will come to them and say, Oh, you have blasphemed the Holy Ghost. So you, you shouldn't even bother trying to come to Jesus. That's a deception. I want to let you know in the name of Jesus Christ that that's a deception. There is something different about you than about the Pharisees. You see, the Pharisees were the people of Israel. They were the circumcised covenant people of God. And they hated God. They hated God because they were wicked religious men who were covetous and they loved the, the praise of men more than the praise of God. So they lived their lives to please men and to trick men out of their money so that the Pharisees could have a position of power and prestige and so that they can dress in 
nice clothes and have nice houses and have all the nice stuff, while at the same time oppressing the people that were under their headship. And when Jesus, the Son of the living God, came on the scene speaking the words of God, they hated him because they hated God. They didn't love God. They didn't love his word. It is written, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. This is something that the Hebrew people call the Shema. Shema is a Hebrew word that means to hear, which is the first word of the verse, Hear, O Israel. So they call that the Shema. It's the very center of the Jewish faith, as it is the very center of the Christian faith. However, the difference is that the Jews don't believe the word of God. If they did, they would worship their God in spirit and in truth, and they would accept the fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. But most of the Jewish people, they don't accept the fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, and the Pharisees were among those wicked Jews who refused to believe the word of God because they had their place and nation given to them by the Roman government, and so they worshipped the Roman Caesar which is why the Jews said, we have no king but Caesar, when they were trying to get Jesus crucified. You see, so the Jews hated God. The Pharisees, they hated God. And when God sent his son into the world, speaking his words, they hated him, and at every opportunity they had, they tried to kill him. And of course, they were unsuccessful until he laid down his life. And then they killed him so that the scripture might be fulfilled and he was risen from the dead and ascended into heaven and shed forth his spirit and then the New Testament began. Praise the Lord. The, the reason I'm explaining all this is is because you, if you have spoken something foolish in the past about the Holy Spirit, you are not a circumcised covenant member of the, of the nation of Israel. You are not someone who is familiar with the scripture and has a covenant with God and has turned to hate God because you love the power and prestige of men more than the the, the honor of God. You see, you are a person who in time past may have said or even thought something stupid and now the devil has come to you, the same one who gave you that thought in the first place. See, it wasn't your thought. It came from him. It came from the devil. And then the same one that gave you that thought in the first place or tempted you to speak that thing in the first place now comes to you and says, oh, look what it says in the scripture. You can't be forgiven. Well, the devil knows that you don't know the scripture. And so it's very easy for him to stand in the pulpit, as it were, and, and take a verse of the scripture out of its context and twist it around and cause you to believe something that isn't true. I've been serving the Lord for 28 years, and I've seen this done in the pulpits many, many times. And the devil doesn't need a pulpit to do that. He can come to you directly, and he can whisper in your ear, and he can say, and he can cause you to think that the thoughts that you're thinking are your own thoughts when they're not. They're from him. And he'll cause you to think that you've blasphemed the Holy Ghost and that you can't ever be saved from your sins. I can't even count the people who have written to me over the years thinking that they have blasphemed the Holy Ghost and that they can never have forgiveness. And I've told them countless times, which is why there are a few videos on this channel about that, because I got tired of writing to people the same thing over and over, so I made a video I could send to people. But you have not committed any sin unto death. You have said something stupid when you were in your sins, just like I did. I mean, when I was lost in my sins and people spoke to me about the Pentecostals who were speaking in tongues, I said stupid, foolish things about them. Okay, I'm not going to go over it and repeat those things because they were stupid, foolish things. But I said some stupid, foolish things. And even Paul, the Apostle of Christ, said in the first chapter of 1 Timothy that before he was a Christian, he was a blasphemer. Paul, the Apostle of Christ, the one who wrote most of the epistles of the New Testament, of our Bible, before he was a Christian, he was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious I mean, he came with soldiers and kicked down the doors of Christians and dragged them off to prison for being Christians. And what happened to him later on? Jesus Christ got a hold of him and made him into a Christian. And so the grace of God was an example upon Paul to those of us who would follow after that whatever it is that you might have done 
in your life not knowing the Lord Jesus Christ can be forgiven if you will obey his gospel. And obeying his gospel doesn't mean accepting him as your personal Lord and Savior, because there's no such thing as accepting him as your personal Lord and Savior. That's a wicked lie that has been spread in the churches by the Jesuits. It's not written in the Bible anywhere. What I mean by obeying the gospel is to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus referred to this as being born of water and of the Spirit. And he said, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You see, the Jews during the Old Testament were born of water and of the Spirit when they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And this is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. And since the New Testament began, 50 days after the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost was poured out, then the apostles began to preach, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and to your children, and to all those that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So that's how a man is born of water and of the Spirit from the day that the New Testament began. And Jesus said, again, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So that's how we obey the gospel of Christ. We don't say a sinner's prayer or accept Jesus Christ into our hearts. We do what the apostles commanded so that we can be saved from our sins. And Jesus is waiting to receive you. And it doesn't matter if you've blasphemed him in the past. I mean, it matters, of course. It's not a good thing or a right thing, and it is a sin. But it doesn't matter if that was your sin, or if you were a rapist, or a fornicator, or a drug addict, or a pharmacist, or, you know, or, or a liar, or a thief, or a homosexual, or whatever. It doesn't matter what your sin was. If you're willing to obey the gospel of Christ, to turn from your sin, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and believe him and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, then whatever you have done in the past will be washed away. That's what his blood was shed for. His blood wasn't shed so that he could forgive some of your sins, but still choose to remember others of them. His blood was shed for the remission of sins. That's what he said when he was at the Last Supper with his disciples. He held up the cup, and you can read this in Matthew 26, verse 28. He held up the cup after supper and he said, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Praise the Lord. For the remission of sins, which means the pardon or forgiveness or washing away of your sins. So when you obey the gospel of Christ, all your sins will be gone. They'll be washed away. Praise the Lord. It doesn't matter what your sin was. It makes no difference what your sin was. Because Jesus laid down his life and took it up again for you. The death penalty has been paid for you. The wages of sin is death. He paid the death penalty. So whatever your sin was, that is irrelevant. His blood will wash it away when you obey his gospel. So if the devil has come to you and said, Oh, you've blasphemed the Holy Spirit. Now you can't ever be saved. He's lying to you. He's lying to you. He's taking something out of context and he's twisting it around and then presenting it to you, showing you a verse of the scripture when you have never read the Bible and you don't understand that he's taking it totally out of context and it has nothing to do with you. And he's using it to try to persuade you to just give up before you even start. And why would he do that? Because he is the devil. Because he doesn't want you to be saved from your sins, and he certainly doesn't want you to be someone who has been redeemed so that you could go around telling other people about the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they can be redeemed. See, because once you become a Christian, you become dangerous to your former father, the devil. You see, when we were born, we were born after the image of Adam, and our father was the devil until we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's two families in the earth. There's the family of the devil and there's the family of Jesus Christ. And everybody that is not in Jesus Christ by his gospel is of their father, the devil. You see, because that's who, whose image they are begotten after. That's who they are obeying. That's who they are living their lives according to. And so when you come to Jesus Christ, then you're not of the devil anymore. But Jesus said to the Pharisees that they were of their father, the devil. That's why they hated God. And that's why they told the people that Jesus was casting out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. 
because they didn't want the people to believe the word of God and wake up and become aware of what they were doing. They were manipulating the word of God to control the people. They were misusing the word of God to create a, a religious form of control and oppression over the people, to keep the people always oppressed and ignorant so that they themselves could live being honored as if they were some great men and live in the lap of luxury. The same thing is going on today in the denominational churches. From the Roman church, where the Pope sits on his throne and the paupers are all around him and he robs them every day and they love to give everything they have to him so that he can sit on his high throne while they scrounge around in the garbage for something to eat. From the Pope of Rome all the way down to the denominational churches or Protestant daughters. Okay, Protestants are Catholics. If you didn't know that, Protestants are Catholics. That's why they're called Protestants, because they're protesting against their mother, the mother church, which is Rome. You see? So Protestants say that they're not Catholics because they're protesting, each one in a different way, against some of the doctrines or practices of their mother, the Roman Catholic Church. But at the same time, they all, all Protestant churches, retain certain aspects of their mother, Pardon me, as far as doctrine or practice. All Protestant churches are Catholic. That's why they're called Protestant. See, so they're all part of the same family. She is the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So if she is the mother of harlots, it stands to reason that her daughters are harlots. The Protestant churches are the harlots that are the daughters of their mother the Roman Catholic Church. By the way, I was quoting to you from Revelation chapter 17, verse 5. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She is the Roman Catholic Church and all of her Protestant daughters. You see, Catholics and Protestants are not Christians. They say that they are. Anybody can say that they're a Christian, but they're not. You're not a Christian unless you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. So one of the most, I, I would say probably the most common trick of the devil is to come to someone, <clears throat> either if they're still a sinner, but they're expressing interest in coming to Jesus Christ, or if they've just come to Jesus Christ, they've just recently been baptized in his name, and now the devil comes to them and gives them a thought or causes them to say a stupid thing, and now he tells them, oh, 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 you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Now, now God will never forgive you. And see, because they don't know the scripture, and he does, he twists it around and uses a verse of the scripture that has absolutely nothing to do with them, and he causes them to believe that they should just now give up. And if they do, they'll be very pleasing to the devil when they could have gone on to seek the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved from their sins and inherit the kingdom of God and be used of God to preach his gospel to others so that they also can inherit the kingdom of God. And that's what Satan doesn't want. So the most common trick of Satan is to come to you when you're a young Christian or even if you're just showing interest in becoming a Christian and to cause you to falsely believe that because you've spoken or thought something that was blasphemous, now you can't come to God. And that's a lie. It's a lie. It's a straight lie. That has absolutely nothing to do with you. Because remember, like I said earlier, Paul, the Apostle of Christ, was a blasphemer. Come with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Let's read this together. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an Apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. That's the first verse. So now we know who's writing this letter. So if we go on a little further, well, let's go to verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Paul said, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a what? Who was before a blasphemer. A blasphemer. Paul was of the sect of the Pharisees. He was one of the Pharisees. Now, we can't say that he ever told Jesus that he was casting out devils by the prince of the devils, because if he had been, if he had said that, then he wouldn't have been writing this letter. He would have been condemned. However, when he was in his ignorance, when he was in his sins, he was a blasphemer. 
he spoke evil things of the Christians and the living God. And so he said, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy. Why? 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 Because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, the Pharisees that blasphemed God that we can read about in Matthew chapter 12, did they do what they did ignorantly in unbelief? No, they did not. They knew the scripture. They saw what Jesus was doing. And they knew that what he was doing was the fulfillment of the scripture. They had to know it. They knew the scripture. But they hated God so much that they said that he was a devil so that they could try to keep the people away from this Jesus who was ruining their form of religion and control over the people. But Paul, when he was a blasphemer, he said that he did it ignorantly in unbelief. See, he did it ignorantly. He had a great zeal for God, but he didn't understand who he was persecuting when he was persecuting the Christians. That's the difference. See, he didn't understand. He said something out of ignorance when he didn't understand. And he goes on to say, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. You see, this happened to Paul. God allowed these things to happen in Paul's life. God allowed him to do the things that he did beforehand, so that, at least in part, so that God could save him and use him for an example, a pattern to them which should believe on him afterward. You see? So, if you didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ and you said something stupid or you had a thought that was a blasphemous thought, which isn't a sin anyway, having a thought isn't a sin, um, but acting out that thought is, if you, if you meditate on a thoughtful, pardon me, if you med a thoughtful sin, if you meditate on a sinful thought, if you say, yeah, 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 and you keep meditating on it until you do it, then that's a sin. Okay, like I've said many times, if you're in a store and you think about stealing something, but then you, then you decide not to, that doesn't make you a thief. Nobody can arrest you for being a thief because you were in a store and you thought about stealing something, but you decided not to. Nobody can arrest you for being a thief because you're not a thief. See, but if you're in a store and you think about stealing something until you finally do it and you walk out the door with it and then you get caught, then you can get arrested for being a thief because you are. Does that make sense? I hope it does. It's really very simple. So having a thought, I know the Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin, and it is. Because if you continue to think about foolishness, eventually you're going to wind up doing something that is sinful. That's where things come from that are sinful. They come from the heart of man. You see? So if you have sinfulness in your heart, and you meditate on that until you wind up doing or saying something that is against God's law, then that's a sin. See? So blasphemy isn't having a thought. Blasphemy is speaking words out of your mouth to curse God. And it is written in Leviticus 24, 15, Whoso curseth his God shall bear his sin. Okay? Now listen to the language there. Whoso curseth his God. That means that if, if God is your God, if you're in covenant with him, if you're baptized in his name, filled with his spirit, and you know him, and he knows you, and then you decide to curse him because you hate him so much, and you hate his word so much, because it's messing up your religious scheme of things, and you curse God, then there is never forgiveness for you. Satan and his angels left their first estate and came down into the earth to take unto themselves human women for wives unto them. Okay, They left their first estate. They were in heaven in the presence of God, and they decided to leave their first estate and to defile themselves with human women. And so therefore, for them, there is no forgiveness. Because they were in the presence of God and they decided to leave. Okay, That's why angels can't be redeemed. That's why Jesus didn't come in the form of an angel. He came in the form of a man. 
Jesus Christ our Lord is a man. He's not an angel. He is the Son of God. The only begotten Son of God, made of a woman, made under the law. He's not an angel, and he didn't come to redeem angels. Angels cannot be redeemed. See, those ones who are holy and are still holy and serving the Lord, they are holy and serving the Lord. And the ones that decided to leave, they can never come back. Because they were there and they decided to leave. And so it is, if you are in covenant with the living God, and you decide to hate him and curse him, then you have no forgiveness. However, if God is not your God yet, okay, you may know about him, and you may believe in him, but you haven't become his yet, you haven't obeyed his gospel, you haven't entered into his presence yet. And for some reason, the devil puts a thought into your mind, pardon me, that is blasphemous, or, or tempts you to speak something even that is blasphemous. And then he comes to you and says, oh, now you can't, you can't come to God. Look what the scripture says, Matthew 12, 31, 32. Bye. Okay, and, and you believe that. It's because you don't know the scripture. See, so you shouldn't believe that. You should continue to seek God in his word. And when I say seek God in his word, I don't mean look on YouTube and try to find a video that will explain your answer for you. What I mean is turn off YouTube and open your Holy Bible, King James Version, and get on your knees and seek God in his word. That's where you're going to get the right answer, the true answer, and the one that no one will be able to take from you. Praise the Lord. So I've been speaking for, for several minutes about this right now, but and I want to go on to some other things. But this is very important. That's why I spent some time on it, because I can't even tell you the amount of letters that I've received over the years from people, especially young people, because they're exposed to the Internet all day long, because they're being bombarded with radio frequency waves and also the garbage content that is posted on online media sources, on, on um, um, social media and things like that. So the young people today, um, parents that are giving their children smartphones and iPhones and laptops with an Internet connection, they have no brain, I guess. I don't know what they're doing. They're not thinking. Okay, but they're just turning their children over to the devil. I, I see I see it all the time. Eight, nine, ten-year-old children walking around with a phone with a screen on it and an internet connection. Where are their parents? Why are these children alone with an internet connection? They've been turned over to the devil. And so because they've been turned over to the devil, then if they ever have, you know, a couple years later, an inkling to come to God, then the devil has no problem telling them that they've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. And then when they have a question, they go to Google. They've learned to go to Google instead of to go to God. And Google will lie to them because Google is artificial intelligence. Google is of the devil. Google is the devil. Now, Google is really good at telling you things like how many seats are in a stadium in Houston or how tall is the Empire State Building and stuff like that. But if you have questions about God, Google is the last place that you want to go because Google is the devil. Google is the devil, okay? Now, not, I'm not saying that Google is the personality that is the devil. What I'm saying is that Google is artificial intelligence, and it is, it, it is a compilation of, of, of things that are contri contributions. That's the word I was looking for. It's a compilation of contributions by men and women and children all over the earth. So when you go to Google, you're seeking the, the opinion, the combined opinion of people in the world that don't know God. And who is the God of people in the world that don't know God? Well, the devil is. The devil is their God. They are of their father, the devil. So if you're seeking Google for answers about God, then you're very likely to get the wrong answer. And that's not only foolish, it's also dangerous. You see? So don't go to Google if you have questions about God. Go to God if you have questions about God. Ask him, and he'll give you the answer. Praise the Lord. So let's go on to point number two that this brother wrote me about. He said, number two is that the devil will try to undermine the trust in Scripture by trying to accuse the Scripture of being inaccurate in regards to something God has not revealed to the individual yet. This is also something that people, especially young people, write to me about all the time. They will write to me about something that they heard online. Somebody told them that there is a contradiction in the Scripture and they've been presented with two or three verses of the scripture that they don't understand, and it seems to them to be a contradiction. So they will write to me and they say, is this a contradiction? And I, I don't know if I should just not believe the Bible anymore because of this. And usually, depending on the cir circumstances and the situation, depending on the intent of their heart, if they're serious and if they're earnest about it, 
then I'll take the time to explain to them, no, it's not a contradiction. It's this or it's that. And then usually they will understand and they'll say, woo. But the point is that if you are seeking God, then the, you have to understand that the devil will come to you and try to knock you off of that narrow way. You see, Jesus said, narrow is the way that leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. And when you find that narrow way, when you come off of the broad path that leadeth to destruction, you know what the broad path is? It's what the religious people call the mainstream. It's the Catholic and Protestant churches. Okay, That's the broad path that leadeth unto destruction. And when you come off of that broad path that leadeth unto when you're in that broad path and you're going to your Baptist church or your Lutheran church or your Pentecostal church or your Catholic church, the devil doesn't care about you because you're not a threat to him. Okay? You don't have the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you're not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to anybody, so you're not a threat to the devil. But when you come off of that narrow path, pardon me, when you come off of that broad path, I should say, and when you come on to the narrow path, now you begin to be a threat to your enemy. And the Bible says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So when you're on that narrow path and you're serving Jesus Christ, no matter at what point you are in your walk, but especially when you're young in your walk, your enemy will come to you and he'll try to use verses of the scripture to confuse you because you're not that familiar with the scripture yet. Okay, That's why I'm always telling people, open your Bible, read the Bible, read God's word for yourself. Don't take my word for it or anybody else's word for it. Read God's word for yourself. The only way that you're ever going to know who's telling you the truth and who's not is to know the truth for yourself. If you don't know the truth for yourself, then you have absolutely no way of judging whether or not a man or a woman is telling you the truth. But you do have something in your hand. If you have a Bible in your hand right now, you have something in your hand that you can use to judge 100% accurately if somebody is telling you the truth or not. But just having this Bible in your hand isn't good enough. You have to have the words of this Bible in your heart. And how do you get them in your heart? Through your eyes. See, as it is said, the eyes are the, are the, are the window of the soul, right? Well, you are a soul. You're a living soul. And what goes in your eyes and also in your ears enters into your heart, the heart of your soul. It enters into the heart of you. And so if you spend your whole life and your whole day taking in the things of this world, then guess what's filling up your heart? The things of this world. See, that's why they that are of the world speak as the world, and the world heareth them. But those of us that are of God speak as the oracles of God, and they that are of God hear us, and they that are not of God hear not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. As John wrote in, in 1 John chapter 4, verses 1-6. through 6. So, that which goes into our heart is going to come out of our mouth. And that's why the enemy is going to come to you to try to tempt you with, by twisting around the Word of God. If you don't know the Scripture very well, he'll take this Scripture and that Scripture and he'll present them to you and they'll say, he'll say, what about that? That doesn't make any sense. That's a contradiction. Why are you even reading the Bible? It's full of contradictions. That's what the devil will say to you. And I've had people write to me many times and say, the Bible is full of contradictions. And you know why they say that? Because somebody told them that. Because they saw a post on Twitter or on Instagram or on Facebook that said that the Bible is full of contradictions. So they decided to write to me, a Christian minister, and proclaim in their great wisdom that, that they learned in one second on Facebook that supposedly the Bible is full of contradictions. But when I asked them to present me with one, they never can seem to do that. Because the Bible isn't full of contradictions. The Bible is God's word. And the fact that you may not understand something right now doesn't mean that it's a contradiction. It means that you don't understand yet. And so when that happens, not if, but when, because this will happen, your enemy will come to you and he will try this on you. Okay, Go to God. Don't go to Google. Go to God. Get alone with God. Read his word. Ask him questions. Pray fast. Seek God. He's real. He's alive. And he delights to answer your questions. You see? And that doesn't mean just get on your knees for five minutes and ask him a question and then get up and go about your day and expect to have the answer. It means when you ask, you must seek. When you ask God a question about his word, then he expects you to read his word and find it. 
You see, God desires to give the treasures of his kingdom to those that seek him diligently. The Bible says God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. If you were a great man, if you were a rich man, you had millions and millions of dollars, and you had several sons, and your sons were to be heirs to your estate, and one of your sons was really wise, and he, he loved you, and he respected you, and he spent all of his days studying you so that he could be just like you, so that he could be responsible with the things that you were going to leave to him. And then you had another son who was a fool, and he spent all of his days at the bar shooting pool and, and, and you know getting with prostitutes and smoking dope and all that stuff. And then they both come to you on a certain day saying, Father, give us of the inheritance. Which one are you going to give the inheritance to? You're going to give it to the one who has shown himself to be a prudent steward of that which you're about to give to him. Are you going to give millions of dollars to your foolish son who's going to go gamble it away at the, at the pool hall or whatever? No, that wouldn't be very wise, would it? You might as well just throw it out the window. It would be the same thing, basically. So God in heaven desires to give the treasures of his kingdom to anyone who will seek him. He's waiting for someone to come to him so that he can give the secrets of him of himself and of his kingdom, the treasures of his kingdom. But he's not just going to put them in a big box, tie a bow around it, and throw it out the window, and the first one who grabs it gets it. No. He's going to wait until people come to him and show themselves faithful and prudent so that he knows that these are people that he can trust with his treasures. See, let's go to Proverbs chapter 2 real quick. Proverbs chapter 2, I want to share with you the first few verses. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Kings and queens came from all over the world in the days where there were no planes, trains, and buses to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And we can just open up this book and read the wisdom of Solomon whenever we want. Praise the Lord. Proverbs chapter 2. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply thine heart to understanding. Apply thine heart to understanding. What does that mean? It means when, when my father tells me something, I do that. I don't just memorize it. I do it. When he tells me to do something, I don't just memorize it and say, okay, I got that memorized. I can go to church now. I have it memorized. I can say it in Greek. <laughs> God's not impressed by whether or not I can say it in Greek. God is impressed by whether or not I believe what he says, and I do it. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as, pardon me, as for hid treasures, then, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Praise the Lord. Then, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. You see, God wants you to come to him and seek him diligently. And if you will, then you will be very pleasantly surprised and you will be very richly rewarded. Praise the Lord. And I speak from experience. Hallelujah. All the time through the... Pardon me, I do speak English. All throughout the past, when ever since I first was born again in 1994... When I came across something that I didn't understand in the Word of God, and I was around other Christians or other disciples, and one guy said this and another guy said that, I knew what I needed to do. I needed to back away from everybody, with all due respect, not you know like being mean or anything, just backing away from everybody, and get alone with God in His Word. Until I got the answer. You see, I, I got alone with God for how long? How long do you need to get alone with God? Until you get your answer. Could be an hour, could be a week, could be a year. Could be 20 years, could be 40 years like Moses. You know, when he was in the desert, tending sheep. You know, he, he, he knew in his heart, God called me to be the deliverer. Why am I out here in the desert tending sheep? Because God had to do some things with Moses before he could do what he had sent him to do. You see, 
So when you seek God for something, how long do you need to seek him for it? And the answer is very simple, until you find it. Because Jesus said, seek and ye shall find. Everyone that seeketh, findeth. So if Jesus said that everyone that seeketh, findeth, then you can know that if you seek God for something according to his will, then you will find it. How long do you need to seek? Until you find it. See, how will you know when you're done seeking? When you find it. Praise the Lord. If there's treasure hid in a field and you go out there with your shovel, how long are you going to have to dig? Until you find it. It's just that simple. Praise the Lord. So, um, number two, what this brother said was the devil will try to undermine the trust in Scripture by trying to accuse the Scripture of being inaccurate in regards to something God has not revealed to the individual yet. There are many things that I could say about this right now, but I digress because I don't want to make this video too long. I want to go to the third point that he mentioned. He said, familiar spirits sending the temptation of a sin, usually the same day, after you make the commitment to overcome it and sin no more. Like, for example, he said an alcoholic's old drinking buddy from years ago calls him up for a drink the day he decides to quit alcohol. Don't you know that this is how the devil works? If there is a sin in your life that you are resolved to get rid of, I can almost guarantee you that if you speak it out of your mouth, that the day that you do that, your enemy will cause somebody to show up in some shape or form and, and try to tempt you to go back into that same sin. You need to recognize that that's an attack from your enemy. See, it is not your failure. It is not because God doesn't love you. It's because he's allowing you to be tested and your enemy will come and test you. If you're a Christian, you may have noticed that whenever you decide to fast because the Lord calls you to fast or because you've decided to fast, it seems like that's the particular day that your neighbor just made his famous burritos and he comes and knocks on your door and says, Hey neighbor, I just made some of my famous burritos. <laughs> and you just decided to go on a fast and you're like, mm. well, do you wonder why that happens? It happens because your enemy, the devil, doesn't want you to be fasting and praying because he knows that fasting and praying is a very powerful combination. So what do you do in a situation like that? You say, thank you, neighbor. Praise the Lord. I'm going to put these in my refrigerator and get to them at a convenient time. And I'm, I know they're going to be delicious. Thank you. Um, praise the Lord. And you put them in your refrigerator. And when you're done fasting, then you will probably enjoy them very much. <laughs> or you can give them to someone else or whatever. Um, uh, but, you, of course, you don't want to lie to your neighbor. You just don't need to tell him everything that... Um, everything that you're doing you know you don't not volunteering information is is not being dishonest so you don't need to lie to him just tell him thank you and receive them and put them in the fridge praise the lord so yes temptation will come when you make a conscious and vocal decision to do something or to turn away from something for your service to the lord jesus christ you can expect that okay don't let it be a surprise to you you can expect it Okay, because your adversary, the devil, is not a concept. He's an actual person. And he also has many other actual persons, uh, unclean spirits, working with him. And they are a very organized network of evil. They communicate with one another. Uh, they have, like this brother mentioned, familiar, familiar spirits. A familiar spirit is just that. It's a spirit that is familiar with you. It is an unclean spirit that has been assigned to you since you came into the world and who has been watching you and who knows you. He knows what makes you angry. He knows what makes you tempted. He knows what makes you upset. He knows what makes you afraid. He knows how to manipulate and fool you. He's been doing it your whole life. And now that you're coming to Jesus Christ, he, is, he has been assigned with the work of trying to get you off of the narrow path. Okay, He doesn't care if you go to church. That's fine. The devil doesn't care if you go to church. He just doesn't want you to be a Christian. See, he doesn't want you to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so that's why he will come at you, especially when you're young, uh, and he will try to knock you off that narrow way. So let's go on to number four. He said um, to accuse you that you're too unclean to read the Bible because you committed a sin. This kind of goes along with the last point. Um, if you say that you're not going to do a certain thing anymore, uh, which is a sin, then, and you stop doing that, then your enemy is going to come to you and he's going to try to tempt you. Or even like I said before, if, you're, you know, if you decide to fast, your enemy will come 
to you and try to tempt you with food. Okay, eating food isn't a sin, of course, but when you're on a fast, then you obviously uh, don't want to be eating food. So, um, but if you if you have a sin in your life that you need to get rid of, and you decide to get rid of that sin, now the devil comes and tempts you to come right back into that sin. And if you fall into it, then the next thing that the devil will do is he'll come to you and say, well, now you can't read the Bible. You can't come to God now. I remember when I was first seeking the Lord, and I was a pothead. I used to smoke pot, marijuana. And uh, it was pretty much a daily thing for me. And when I would read the Bible sometimes, I felt really good. But then when I would smoke pot, I wouldn't feel like reading the Bible at all. I would think about it, but then I would say, no, I can't read the Bible right now. Because I was high. See? And the devil knows that when you're in sin, what comes with sin? Guilt. Condemnation. See? So, when you're in sin, the devil comes to you and says, well, you're in sin. You can't read the Bible now. When, in fact, that's the time when you should be reading the Bible the most. Because that's what's going to show you your sin and give you the strength and the conviction in your heart to come away from it. When you look at the Word of God, which is the perfect Word of life, which is actually like a mirror which shows us who we are, um, then and it shows us the inner things of our heart that we can't see without the Word of God showing us, then that's what's going to convict my heart. That's what's going to give me what I need to come away from that sin. When I get in the presence of God... That's exactly what I need to hate my sin enough to get away from it. See, but when you sin, your adversary, the devil, will come to you and he'll say, Oh, look, you sinned. Now you can't read the Bible. And you won't feel like reading the Bible. Because that's the trick of the devil. There's many other things that, that this brother wrote about. Um, accusations against the New Testament in general and also accusations against Paul. I want to address those things kind of together. Um... When you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, and especially in these days, those of you who are millennials and you don't even remember a time when there was no internet, um, for you, the internet is a way of life. And for you, YouTube, um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and all that stuff is part of your daily life when it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. It's very, very unhealthy physically, emotionally, and spiritually. It's very, very unhealthy. It's very bad for you to be looking at all that stuff. However, you're looking at me on YouTube right now, and I'm glad that you are. And hopefully when you're done with this video, you'll turn off your internet connection and start reading your Bible, seeking God, without any internet devices turned on in your house. That's where you should be. Praise the Lord. However, I said all that to say this. When those of you who are young in the faith... You come to the Lord Jesus Christ and then you get on YouTube or you get on Facebook or one of these um, social networks and you start reading commentaries from people, religious people, and, because the religious arena on social networks is poison. It is absolute poison. It is like you're just born, you're a little baby, and, and your mom and dad just go on a trip and leave you alone in, in, in the midst of some quicksand pits. Okay, and you're like in your backyard full of quicksand pits, all alone, little baby. You have no idea what's going on. You're like, da 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 da, da. Your, your thumb in your mouth and stuff, picking up rocks and putting them in your mouth or whatever. And you're just, you know, there's the quicksand. Boop. You know, it's, it's so easy to be destroyed when you're young in the faith and you have no one over you in the Lord teaching you the truth of the doctrine of Christ. And you're not abiding in the Word of God, so you're just wandering around among the quicksand pits. And in this particular parable, the quicksand pits are the religious commentaries on the social media networks. And they will tell you all sorts of things. They'll tell you, uh, they'll, they'll accuse the New Testament. They'll tell you things like, well, it wasn't really written until after such a time and it was just done by memory. And, and you know, they'll tell you carnal, stupid things like, you know, well, well John wrote the Gospel of John just by memory and and, you know, the, the book of the Revelation was written. Yeah, I don't even want to go into that because I don't want to put these things in your mind. But they'll say a lot of things that are not true about the books of the New Testament. But the Bible testifies that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So... When we come to God, do we believe God's word? 
or believe, do we believe the words of men? See, there are many others out there online who are a very wicked and vicious people who will say to you, Paul wasn't really an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was an imposter, and he taught things that are contrary to what Jesus taught. Well, these people are completely ignorant of what the Bible says because nobody could ever read the Holy Bible with the desire to, to know God and to serve him, to obey his word, and ever come away with the thought that Paul, the apostle of Christ, ever taught anything that was contrary to the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ because he didn't. The teachings of Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, are 100% in absolute agreement with the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ and with all the law and the prophets, all the way back to Moses. But there are a lot of people who are of the devil who will come to you and they will accuse Paul of not being an apostle of Jesus Christ. Why do they do that? To keep you away from the blessed writings of the New Testament that the Holy Ghost gave to Paul to give to us. See, to take away the name of Jesus Christ out of your mouth. That's another thing, though, that, 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 that the wicked Satanists will do. They will try to tell you that Jesus isn't really the name of the Lord. And that if you want to know the name of the Lord, you have to go back to the original Hebrew, which they think that they have, which, of course, they don't have. So they read these perverted Bibles and these perverted commentaries from Jewish theologians who reject Messiah, and they change the name of the Lord, or think to change the name of the Lord, from Jesus to other names like Yahweh or Yahushua or Yahuwah or, you know, all kinds of other silly things like that. And God never said any of those names. God never spoke to any of his prophets ever and said that he would be called by any of those names. There is no Yahweh. There is no Yahuwah. I mean, there might be a guy somewhere with that name, but it's not God's name. God's name is Jesus Christ. The only name for God in the New Testament of our Holy Bible is Jesus Christ. And Peter, his apostle, said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. The name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ. And it's written over 900 times in the New Testament of our Holy Bible. Jesus is a name that means Jehovah the Savior. That's what Jesus means. It's not just a name like Phil or Charlie. It's a name that means something. It means Jehovah the Savior. And of course, Christ is a title. Jesus is the Christ, which means he's the anointed one. So when you say Jesus Christ, what you're saying, the significance from the original language is the one which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty who has come in the flesh to save us. That's what the name Jesus Christ means. And so that's why it is the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And if you're not very familiar with the Scripture, then you might not understand that yet. If you, especially if you haven't even read through the whole Bible at least once then you probably haven't come to understand that yet. And so people come to you and they'll say, oh no, Jesus is a, is, a, is a pagan name and all that stuff. And they'll tell you that, you know, they'll take words out of foreign languages that sound similar to words in English. And then they'll tell you that these words in foreign languages mean different things. And so that they must mean the same thing in English, which is, if I may use the word again, stupid. It's just stupid. Like I speak Spanish and English. Okay? So, in English, the word sin, S-I-N, means a transgression of the law, according to 1 John. I think it's chapter 3, verse 4. Sin is the transgression of the law. Sin. But in Spanish, the word sin, S-I-N, the same word, sin, means without. Like I could have a hamburger without onions. Dame una hamburguesa sin, sin cebolla, por favor. Por favor. Okay? Sin cebolla means without onion. Okay, sin means without. It doesn't mean a transgression of the law. It means without, something that is without something. Okay, so I can't take the word sin from Spanish and put it into an English sentence and tell you that it means the same thing that it does in Spanish because it doesn't. It's the same word that's spelled the same way, but it's a different word because it's in a different language. And so people will come to you and they'll take words from the Greek language and they'll say, well, the word Zeus in Greek means this or that. And then they'll say, well, Jesus, you know, is it, you know, and, and they'll, they'll tell you terrible and blasphemous things about the name of the Lord. 
by taking words from foreign languages that sound the same as words or parts of words from the English language, and then they'll try to convince you that these words from that language mean the same thing in English, and that's just stupid. That's just completely stupid. <laughs> and, and anybody with half a brain would realize that that just doesn't make any sense at all. But lots of people running, run around doing that. You see, and they'll convince you, or they'll try to convince you, that the name of the Lord is that, that we see written in the Bible over 900 times is actually a pagan name and that you should call him by a different name. And why do they do that? Because Jesus said, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay their hands upon the sick. Pardon me. And they shall recover. In my name. In my name. The apostles preached, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So obviously, if your adversary, the devil, can come to you and trick you out of the name of the Lord, then you're no longer a threat to him. If you're not doing what you're doing and saying what you're saying in the name of the Lord, then you're no longer a threat to the devil. Because the Bible says, whatsoever ye do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. I believe that's in Colossians 3.17. So there are many things, my brethren, and especially my young brethren and sisters, that your adversary the devil will come to you and try to do to you, to try to destroy your faith, to try to knock you off of the narrow path. But how can you overcome? I will tell you how you can overcome. And I will tell you how you can overcome 100% of the time. Stay in the Word of God. Read the Word of God. I testify unto you that no matter how long you've been a Christian, if you've been a Christian more than six months and you haven't read the whole Bible, every page, all the way through at least once, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. You should be reading through the Bible at least one time every six months. If you've been a Christian for ten years, you should have read the whole Bible, every page, at least twenty times by now. Now I'm not saying I'm not putting that as a standard like if you you know if you're reading the Bible and you and it takes you 7 months like you're in sin or something like that. I'm not saying anything like that at all. What I'm saying is that if you're a Christian and you just go to church and you don't know what the Bible says because you've never actually read the entire Bible, you're in trouble because your adversary knows the whole Bible. And there's a video on this channel that is called Why does the devil know the Bible better than you? And I would ask that question of you right now. Now, if you've just been a Christian for a month or two or whatever, I understand you're working your way through the Scriptures. But, you know, when I first came to Jesus, when I was first born again, I set myself to read five chapters a day. Nobody told me to do that. No man, at least, told me to do that. I set myself to read five chapters a day. No matter what happened, at the end of my day, before I went to sleep, I read five chapters of the Bible. Even if I was tired, even if I didn't have enough time to get eight hours of sleep before the next day I had to get up, didn't matter. I read five chapters of the Bible. Especially when I came to the Revelation, I read the whole thing through in one night. I couldn't stop. I couldn't put it down. I was reading till about two o'clock in the morning. But, um, and I read through the whole Bible in about six months. So I know that it takes about six months, if you read five chapters a day, to get through the Bible. So if you've been a Christian for more than six months and you haven't read the whole Bible even once, then you're in trouble because your adversary knows every word of this Bible. He knows every word of it. And he is standing in the pulpit in most churches through preachers who have graduated from Jesuit seminaries and he is misusing portions of this Bible and preaching to you things that are lies straight out of the Bible, twisting the words of God around and preaching to you things that are lies and you don't know it because you don't know what the Bible says. I see it happen all the time. And especially if you're a young Christian, these are some of the lies that the devil will come to you with. So if he comes to you and tells you that you have blasphemed the Holy Ghost because you had a thought, because you said a stupid thing before you were even a Christian or even as being a young Christian and you did it in ignorance, you have not committed a sin unto death. You have not committed a sin that God will never pardon you for. You may have committed a sin, but if you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, then he'll forgive you. And if you've already obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and you commit a sin in ignorance, then you can confess 
your sin and forsake it, and he will forgive you. And he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You see, and when people come to you falsely accusing the Bible of being untrue or falsely accusing Paul the Apostle of Christ of being a false apostle and all that stuff, what do you do about that? You seek God about it. Okay, if you're a little boy and someone comes to you and says, your dad is a this or that, what do you do? Do you go to a shopping mall and ask everybody in the shopping mall about whether your dad is a this or that? No. You go home and you talk to your dad with tears in your eyes. Dad, somebody said you were this or that. And dad's going to say, hey, we're just lying to you. I'm not a this or that. I'm your dad. So thanks for coming to me so that I could tell you the truth. And if you're a Christian, that's what you do. You go to your father in heaven. When somebody comes to you and says something about the word of God, what do you do? You don't go to the shopping mall and ask everybody at the shopping mall about what they think about this thing in, in the Bible. You don't go to Facebook. You don't go to YouTube. You don't go to Google. You go to your father. You go to your father and you say with tears in your eyes, Father, somebody said this about your word or about your apostle or about you. And then he'll say unto you, they were lying to you, my son, my daughter. Here's the truth. Let me show it to you in my word. And he will. Praise the Lord. May these things be a blessing and an encouragement to those of you who are new in the faith. And thank you for being here with me for a little over an hour now. I didn't mean to make this message so long, but there was a lot to talk about. So praise the Lord. And those of you who are older in the Lord, may this be a blessing and encouragement to you as well. And please also be mindful to share this video with those that are young in the faith and let them know that even though it's an hour long, there's a reason that it's an hour long. And if they're willing to go to church and sit there for an hour and listen to a sermon by a man who's probably not telling them the truth, then how much more should they be willing to sit down and give their attention to a video message of a man of God speaking the words of God so that they can be strengthened in God and serve God and enter into the kingdom of God? Blessed be the name of the Lord. I remain here for you to serve you in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you have a question or a comment, there is the comment section right below. Also, if you want to talk to me about something that's a more personal matter, my email address is also right there in the information box. You can write to me. Yours truly is going to be the one to answer you. Um, sometimes I'll be able to answer you within a few minutes. Sometimes it might take me up to a whole day, depending on how busy I am. But I will always get back to you in a timely fashion, and, and I will answer you in a manner worthy of the question or comment that you have. Praise the Lord. I'm here to serve you and to to make sure that you as far as, as as much as in as much as in pardon me in as much as in me is i'm here to make sure that you enter into the kingdom of god with much treasure i'm here to do all that i can to ensure that that happens that's why i'm here okay i'm in full time ministry i'm here for you 24/7 i have to sleep sometimes and stuff but basically i'm here for you 24/7 so put me to work blessed be the name of the lord Amen.